Uh, but even before the exercise, I need to tell you a little bit about myself and why Carl Steele thinks I'm still qualified to do um, workshops here. So <coughs> uh, I'm a CPA, which means a certified public accountant, uh, which means I'm really good with numbers. If I start using Excel, uh, you'll probably vomit. It's like seasickness. I don't really fast. Uh, your financial models will probably uh, I hope they pass my scrutiny if you ever need that. Uh, but I, I used to do art with financial modeling. Like I really love it that much. The way I really the reason why I really like finance and numbers is they don't they talk back to you and you understand them. If you understand them, it's a really nice conversation. So I started in the watch. I did a lot of work. I think that helped me understand a lot of different business models. I traveled a lot. I saw a lot of sectors. I audited a lot of companies, uh, Coca-Cola, Lafarge, yada, yada. Uh, then I started doing, um, working as a professional in university. So past 20, past 16 years, I had financial profession. Uh, first one was Bilgi, was acquired by an international group. Um, I did a lot of work with International Finance Corporation to get some loans. So the amounts of money I helped raise is north of $10 million, but six of them was as a corporate, corporate finance guy. Uh, the rest is for startups. So after that, I was very lucky. They said, well, we're good with numbers, but it's black and white. Now, uh, why don't you learn some gray? Said, why? What do you mean? Uh, business is a little tricky, marketing and yeah, other business development, so you need to be a little more flexible. So, okay, I mean, I'll, fine, I'll try. So I started doing a lot of um, teaching. I did my MBA. While doing the MBA, I learned that there's something called marketing, that people lie to each other, so you sell the <laughs> stuff. Nah, I'm kidding. Uh, not really, but that's okay. Uh, anyways, a good, uh, and I learned a lot about why marketing is critical, and I'll tell you a little bit about it later. Uh, and then I started to make a lot of this is a time where everything, I mean, I saw a lot of you having the four steps of epiphany and the startup manual. Um, I forgot the year, but I think it was 2008. Let me check. 12. 12, that's funny. So I started doing this before the book, apparently. But that worked out well. I learned a lot from the people you already know. So. I know uh, Eric Ries, uh, Steve Blank, Alexander Osterwalder. So I was really in the US coming back and forth, learning to do this when nobody in the world actually knew. I was just a curious guy. I still am a curious guy. Then I did this uh, Girishim Fabricus uh, in Ozin University. And that's the reason why I'm here actually today. Because while at Ozin, I, Abdurrahman and the, the seed fund management was trying to get startups from Kaust actually be startups. They were researchers. Uh, a lot of them had a lot of great technology, but they were not commercializing it. So they came to Turkey. I delivered the program, but it was both a boot camp and a food camp. I don't know how many of you have been to Turkey and came back without gaining weight. Uh, so those who are laughing probably understand the joke. But we have really good food, and I really took them to the fanciest places. Not only on food level, but they had the greatest experience to meet Corporate ventures, venture capitalists, angel investors, technology enthusiasts. We, I really knocked the shoes out of them. And then they said, every good deed has a price. They said, okay, come to Kaos. I said, okay, how is it? I came to Kaos January 14, 2014. Um, and it was really a joy after that, 14, 15, 16. There was nothing in the kingdom, almost nothing. There were a little, a few startups, accelerators, incubators here and there. Uh, we built, I'm not going to be shy and I'm going to be We built the best programs in Saudi at that time. And I still have friends, Ihab, very much. I still have friends uh, who became uh, <coughs> who became entrepreneurs, who really changed the landscape in Saudi. Uh, 14, 15, 16, I was here. Uh, and from one Mecca, I moved to another Mecca in 2016. I moved to the Mecca of Silicon Valley. So I went to San Francisco, lived there for three and a half years um, with something called Gold Circuit. Uh, we invested in early stage startups, more than 21 of them. Some of them have raised funding from the most reputable VCs in, in, in the world. 
uh, and Skype and Tesla and Hotmail and Baidu, Coinbase, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and then I start working with um, international groups. One of them is UC Berkeley. I'm now a global ambassador for UC Berkeley, Stargis Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. And I'm certified to train on behalf of Stanford Center for Professional Development. So I disclose them because it's not Stanford, it's Stanford Center for Professional Development because like, departments are fighting each other as always in New York City. But and uh, during the pandemic, I got back to Turkey actually one year before. So I did this United Nations uh, Impact Accelerator program for SDG Impact Accelerator. I started doing Founder Institute in Turkey, which is still running and successful. And I delivered our accelerators program online. Uh, I loved the fact that I could reach out to a lot of places and people online, but I never just like breaks this. Like I can go and hug and sometimes punch the founders in the stomach if they're not listening. Uh, and that's that's the joy I have. I'm really happy and grateful for being here. A couple of days ago was Thanksgiving. To me, I feel like it's, it's Thanksgiving for me every day. As, as long as I'm able to work with startups, I'm really happy. I'm crazy as well, um, unless you've noticed already. Uh, so I have three startups. One of them is this large consultancy group that we build in Estonia. We help a lot of companies. Um, one of the largest global companies that we help is Siemens. So we are running the Siemens Corporate Entrepreneurship Program. Those of you who have any relatives, anybody working in Siemens, Right. Ask them about Next 47. And if they're not part of Next 47, tell them they're, he's missing out or she's missing out. They have to be part of it. It's a great corporate entrepreneurship program. We're also running one of the largest <coughs> entrepreneurship program in Turkey. That's something I believe it works. So that's Yellow X. Actually, the name is the name is funny. And it's, again, the three, three of us have came with the idea. Um, that and then I decided to do something interesting. So I try helping people of all ages, 14 to 84, where I was talking in a call. The oldest person ever to come into my class is 84. So I, and the youngest was 12. So it was more like a fun game exercise. We did a lot of work with Cal School here as well. But so I, I teach people from 14 to 84. Sage is Students Academy for Global Entrepreneurship. I said series of videos on-demand exercises, as well as inspirational talks that we deliver to high school students, as well as university students and graduates. It's a corporate program as well. If you, you want to have entrepreneurial talent, then you can work with us. And Zillion Pitches is also something critical. Um, I should have put Tim Draper's video here. So Zillion Pitches, I teach people how to pitch a lot. And I probably trained up. Uh, 2,000, maybe 3,000 people over the 10 years. So I said, oh, who else can actually put all that knowledge, know-how, and, and information in an algorithm but me? So we built an algorithm uh, through other pitches that were, were done globally, and we trained our algorithm. So all of you who are happy to pitch in English, pitch it, record it, put it on Zillion pitches, and it's the system is supposed to give you a report on how good or how bad your pitch is. If it doesn't, let me know. <laughs> now I can, I can take a few punches. Let me know if the system does not give you a report that's meaningful. It has to give you on your performance, your hands and thumbs and filler words, as well as quote unquote in French, shit like when you say, oh, I don't have competition. So if you say something like it, the system will say, yeah, think twice. Um, but let me know because, yeah, it's really difficult to run all this. And I'm not a techie guy, so I don't understand how it works. But if it breaks, I can't fix it. That's the problem. Uh, so Sage and Zillow, try it out. Go for it. We even have a small demo. Those of you are interested, those of you are people who should learn about entrepreneurship, uh, I can send you the demo for free. It's a really fun half an hour thing. Uh, and this is scale through train the trainers programs. It's still uh, hard to say it's a startup, but it's growing. Alhamdulillah. Uh, the other one is super scalable, but I just need to spend a lot of time and build a team and fundraise, and I don't like to do that. 
so I'm in your shoes. But I, yeah, I know, I know. I, I really don't like to fundraise. I, if I have a good technical co-founder that also can like interact with people because some technical co-founders don't interact with people, I will get into a good accelerator program that's really very easy. It's post-product, post-revenue, good team. The only thing that's missing is it doesn't have a full-time team. So I feel for you. Those of you who are not full-time, I feel for you. Those of you trying to fundraise, I feel for you. So, um, but my feelings don't mean much. You have to go through it. <laughs> uh, if you need to cry over it, you have my shoulder. Um, and it's fine. So, uh, I'll, I will need you to use your phones because there's going to be a lot of QR codes over here. So, feel free to do it. This is, I'll, I'll show it again at the end. So, we don't need to turn all this. Because it's a feedback on how do how I do perform. I like to measure um, every time I do something. I like to kind of do it a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better every time. So if you got any feedback for me, shoot. Uh, Twitter is where I'm active. Trying not to be active that much because it's just these days a shit show. Uh, as I told you, I'm Turkish, so we got a lot of things going on. Um, my, my email is right there. So after consuming 20 minutes of your time, uh, I just like to show you this. Uh, being an entrepreneur is really difficult. A lot of people think they know what you're doing. Sometimes you think what you, you know what you think you're doing, uh, but not everything goes as planned. Like that's okay. And yeah, your friends might be cool. Uh, yeah, society was the cool, but you're kind of things that way. Usually, you're pencil out trying to figure out the same thing. Um, but what you should be doing, and I hope you guys are already doing it, some of you are, um, you should be doing one thing and one thing only, and that's sales. What would kill a startup? What's the only thing that would kill a startup? No sales. One, yeah, distraction. Action? Distraction. Distraction can kill us. Yeah, I mean, fine. Cash flow problem. Cash flow The only thing that will kill you is running out of money. Like you run out of money and gave them tell us. I mean, um, nothing else will kill you. If you have enough money, you can get away from touch, like being, being distracted will not kill you, harm you, not kill you. Not having sales will harm you, not kill you. As long as you have money, eh, you, you, you have some place to go and fix this. That was 2021. <laughs> now, we're in a different world. Good for some of you, not good for some of you. Let me, start, let me not say many of you. Fundraising is not getting easier for the next three years. Okay. Yeah. So if you are building a startup that needs fundraising to grow, uh, may Allah give you patience. <laughs> Somebody, uh, God give you patience. Uh, <coughs> if you are able to prove you don't need the money, then all good. Hell, because investors will come and find you. So that's the trick. Before investors will come and try to see potential, now the thing you have to understand from the VC side as well, if a VC has fundraised, that's done. They have fundraised. Yeah. They are not going to go back to their LPs and tell them, oh, I am such a bad venture capital general partner that I couldn't find any teams to invest. So keep your money to yourself. That's not going to happen. Yeah. They're not raising money on a case by case basis. They went out, they raised money and they, they're, they're not sitting on it by the way. That's something you have to know. When a VC partner, general partner gets uh, their money, uh, the little thingy, yeah. When they get their money, so these are limited partners. This is a general partner. He or she is the one who give you money. They go out, they find startups. And when they find startups, they say, okay, I found this startup. 
let's say I need two million dollars to put into the startup, and then he or she goes and gets the money. It's called capital call. That's what it is. It calls in the capital and then gets the money and puts it into the startup. So the money the VCs have is are is not in their bank account. They have commitments from limited partners to get the money when they need to and put it into the money. So what this means is if they raise money, if their commitments are there, they need to spend the money. No other way around it. Unless they say, okay, Mahalas, I'm done. I don't want to be a GP or I want to retire. I don't want to do this anymore. So they need to find startups. These days, the good thing for some of you is you may say you need $2 million and they would want to give you more. They'll say, ah, good, but I'll give you three. Because they're trying to invest in less startups in numbers, but they still need to put the same amount of money. So what they're doing is they want to play safe. They want to give you more money. Previously, a lot the best practice was raising money for 18 months. Now, the best practice is raising money for 24 months. That's what usually VCs start to say. And if they, if you, if some of you are fundraising, if some VC comes to you and say, you need to raise for 24 months, don't be alarmed, don't be shocked. They're not trying to hide something behind you. They're just being very cautious and they also <laughs> want the startup to feel cautious. So they plays for both sides. But you cannot go to them and say, no, no, I, I only want to have money for 18 months. I mean, if, in this environment, if you find the money, just go there. So that's that's a side discussion. I forgot it, right? So again, if you do not need them to survive, <clears throat> keep it that way, then you can fundraise. I'm not saying it's impossible to fundraise anymore. You can fundraise, but you'll need to fundraise and you need to get live. You know, machines have a default mode. Like you open them, they just come up with whatever settings. That's a default setting. Your default setting has to be alive no matter what. That's the only thing. No more, I'll figure it out later stories. It didn't fly with most Middle Eastern VCs anyways, but now it will never fly with anyone. So figure out a path to be self-sustainable, which means you may not grow as fast as you want because you're not burning a lot of money on marketing, you're not hiring a lot of people, but if you survive the next six months, then things will be a little bit easier for you who are fundraising. If you need fundraising now, again, Allah sabari, but I'll teach you a way to survive and be default alive. That's very, very important. So all the blah, blah, blah. What you should not do is like fundraise and spend it for nothing. That's all the, those days are done. <coughs> but we need to, I'm here today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow. So I will be able to caliber the content a little bit based on your feedback. And now is the time to just scan this thing out, let me know if it works, and fill out the form so I have a better understanding of the level of intensity, the level of knowledge, the level of um, experience about finance for, for you guys. So, I'll give you a few more minutes, just fill it out, and then we're going to have fun. So if it doesn't work, let me know. It should work. As it gives us, it takes the Gmail email, not the one that we have. It's okay? No, it's okay. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm not going to email you unless you give me explicit permission to email you. So that's that's okay. It's fairly easy if, if you feel like you need to ask me anything, I'm here. Otherwise, you should be able to do it.
I should like some, some um, Jedi music. I'll put all the all the What's the most important? <coughs> we don't have tricky questions, so don't don't feel like I'm going to judge you by not giving the right answer. Every every answer is the correct answer, whatever your stage is. And you might have different team members. You don't need to fill as a team because this is you go as a founder. Maybe tomorrow we'll have a different batch of founders with doing something else. So I don't know. Uh, don't feel bad about trying to come up with the same level. Don't answer as a team. Personal information. So, so we're talking about So I know the structure, but I don't necessarily know okay. the numbers. It's okay. No worries. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. It's just a, um, a little x ray you can say. And um, I will have you work on different things if some of you already have a lot of financial background, a lot of you are in fintech. That doesn't mean necessarily you know the fintech side. Modeling means the financial projection, expenses versus... Uh... Business modeling is how you make money in relation to what you're building, how you're distributing, and how you're making sure you get access. Yeah, I know how to do okay. that. Perfect. Because some of you are in different stages of your development, so that's perfectly fine. Need a few more minutes. Ish. What does high mean? My neighborhood. <laughs> My neighborhood. My neighborhood. My neighborhood. Because you'll hear me saying a lot of hadi. Hadi, 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 hadi. You know what hadi is? I think it's cash flow. No? Hadi, hadi. hadi. With ha or with ha? <laughs> <laughs> so great. Well, I'll tell you the story why that made me laugh. When I came to Kaus, before I, I mean, I accepted the offer and things are getting in logistics, they organized. And I started learning Arabic all month. So I, I didn't tell anyone because I didn't know anyone. So I came in, I waited for two, more, two weeks. And I kept learning a little bit. All I wanted to was say, okay, good morning. How are you? <coughs> and then I came to the office and there's right there, Amal and Abdurrahman are sitting and Hattan. So I went to, Amal was the first one at the door. I said, Ezei Khabibi. <laughs> so, and then the office froze. <laughs> it was really Saudi and those of you didn't get the joke, is a Habibi is very casual way of saying good morning, how are you, my friend in Egyptian, <laughs> Arabic. Yeah. not in Saudi Arabic. Habibi is not a word you use to friends in Saudi. So Habibi is a little bit more close <laughs> in Saudi. And like Abdurrahman is like, can you come here for a second? <laughs> <laughs> Man, what are you doing? I'm like, what am I doing? I said, is a Habibi? <laughs> But that's Egyptian Arabic. Like, what do you mean Egyptian? Arabic is Arabic. And it's like, dude, like you're coming from Turkey, you're just cool as yeah. uh, so, we'll, so don't say it, we'll teach you how to say kifare. Yeah. So I said, okay, then when you say ha or ha, to me it's ha. Yeah, it's the oh, same yeah. thing. Yeah. But again, for many people, it's a very different time. Uh, so hadi hadi, you'll hear me saying a lot, means I mean, not shuaya shuaya. Quickly, quickly, yeah, let's finish this whole four thing because I need to get you out. Uh, so I, I'm giving you. Uh, huh? What's If you don't know, let's say I don't know. That's okay. Uh, so we will count until 10. And I, one time I knew how to count 10 in Arabic. I don't know it anymore. So Turkish on that one. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Palace. <coughs> If you are in the middle of it, just finish it. If you're not, then it's fine. I hope you finished it up already. So now what we will do, it might seem a little irrelevant, but believe me, it will grow somewhere. So I put eight different sectors here. You might be in different ones. You might be in the intersection of a couple of them, but you need to pick a number, OK? So anybody? In agro, health, fintech, yada, yada, you'll need to pick that number and I will hold it down and then we'll do an exercise. So, 
that's the place is huge so you should be fine you need to get up among your group and again don't worry you, you can change if you're two people for example and if you're between six and eight you don't know which one exactly you can go to another room this is just a small exercise I'll tell you the reason of the exercise. It's a finance course, fine, yes. But how many of you are serial entrepreneurs and have two exits at least? None of you. How many exits? Two failures. Two? Failures. Good. Perfect. Uh, you sold your company for over $10 million twice. No. All right. That's what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want to do that anyways um so two so it's fine i mean you I'll, you'll you'll find your people and the, re the reason why you need to find your people is i will tell in detail why it's important but this group itself this is the first time you're coming with this intensity at least and within different sectors you're operating really well you think you know what you're doing but you need a common wisdom and common wisdom cannot come from me because i'm only one wisdom what you need to do you need to understand what everybody else is doing on a really personal level so that when you leave here on thursday for those of you who stay in the program or those of you who leave the program it doesn't really matter you have a support system i have not thought about that when I was building my companies and these are the ones that are alive. I showed you two. I have other two companies that did not end up well. <laughs> so <clears throat> I call them failures. No, I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned is uh, as a founder, you need a support system. If you don't have a support system build up of entrepreneurs working on the same field, you will be in deep trouble. And one thing that you will realize in about six months, half of the group here will not be continuing what they're doing. Six, I mean, nine months. And that's not, that's, that's going to hurt. I mean, I'm with you, but some of you will not survive the next nine months and some of you will not survive the next 18 months for various reasons. One of which is the economy, the other one is inflation, the other one is lack of funding, the other one is lack of team, the other one is lack of, uh, you'll sell, but you're not going to get the money. So you'll be there going through a lot of pain. Uh, well, I mean, we'll, we'll get there, we'll get there. But what you can do, what you will do, is the minute you start feeling stressed, and the minute you go like, okay, I think I will need to shut this down, the first five people you're going to give a call is probably here. And you will tell them, I have this, whatever that is, and it's valuable, but it does not pick up. Can we merge? Are you doing something that's relevant? I know you had been doing X, Y, Z, because we met and this guy Ozan put us together and we talked about food and animals and celebrities. So we know each other really well, which you will do in a second. So you're going to give them a call and say, what can I do? What can we do? Uh, so let's work this out together. This is something that you <coughs> need a lot. And this is the path to a healthy growth for two companies together. There is a lot of talent in this room. Some of you will not be doing what you think you will be doing in a year, but you will still be able to build startup. I really don't want any one of you to go back to work and get salaries. Salary people will not save anything or any one of us. What they do is they're good at their work, but they're not passionate. They don't care about usually. They don't care about what you do, but you guys, every single one of you here, cares a lot about what you do. You came here with so many different ideas. You already passed a few stages. And believe me, I mean, I was one of the few people who kind of saw you much before. And there are so many teams that you pass through. It doesn't mean you're going to be successful and you have to determine what success is for you, but I'm going to help you. And maybe through this way, you're going to finance your life going forward, maybe working for a founder sitting next to you 
but doing something that's interesting, even though you're getting a salary, you're doing something you're passionate about. <laughs> we need more passionate people. We need more people doing real things. And this is what we're going to discuss. You're not going to pitch what you're doing. You will, of course, you can't stop yourselves, that's fine. But the basics of the conversation is about things you'll like. One, yeah, you're not still, you, the cost feeds you really well. Uh, you're not hungry, but talk about your best food. What do you like the most? Celebrity, actor, actress, poet, uh, painter, doesn't matter. Argentina, let me see. <laughs> True, he plays poetic, but he's going to screw his company. <laughs> Let's see. I hope I hope uh, Saudi gets through the channel. For reason. And musicians, music is cool. It binds us together. You can share music. You can open up your YouTube and show people what you listened. And the animal. It can be your spirit animal if you believe in such thing. But it can be any animal you like. Don't just say oh, I like cats. I like dogs. Or like unicorns. Or unicorns. So, uh, real or not, it's fine. Unicorns are real if you believe they're real. Uh, they're not real anymore in most sort of places. But again, I'm giving you 15 minutes to go through to your group, find a place. I mean, you guys are grown up, you can find a place to talk about. They want to kill you out, but they're killing you. So, what's uh, the how much you're burning per month? Uh, currently, like our operational cost is around like 12k dollars right. monthly. So, and this is including everything. This is it's salary? wages only. And what else you're paying for? Uh, we're paying for like software hosting and. So your burn is around maybe 20. Maybe 20,000, oh. let's say, yeah. So. He raised 250 with a 20k burn rate. In one year, less than a year, the money is gone. He couldn't fundraise. The revenues are dropping. He said, Halas, I mean, I raised with 10. I couldn't sustain what we did. Nobody is giving us a $10 million valuation. Sorry. But I have clients that are giving me $200,000 per month, per year, which is like, is it yearly renewal or? So this is like November 2023. How much is this company worth in November 23? He calls you up and says, well, you know, shit happens. We couldn't fundraise. We're running out of money. We only have three months left. I want to sell. Normally, we will uh, multiply this uh, recurring revenue on, on a certain number. But in this situation, what is that certain number? There is an average of three to five X. Currently, I think it's two X or yeah, because of the recession, <clears throat> right? Depends okay. on the industry. It depends on your margin. Good. Yeah. It's a way of doing it is to look at companies which are operating in a similar domain and then oh, taking right. maybe 15 companies and seeing what are their multiples, extract outliers and then take the average out of that. And then be, this is a good case for investors to. I know investors. I think you know. Good case for <laughs> ourselves to. How be. much? How much is he worth? Nothing. Run out of money. Why should I buy? Do you? Good. Maybe. I think it depends how how much will the investor will pay. So. There are no investors, man. Alas. You couldn't fundraise again, it's running out of money, he has three months left. So what, so he's selling it out? So he's yeah, selling it out. Yeah. How much are you paying? How much is this company worth? It depends on the, if there's any value of the IP, if that software is strategically valuable to another. Can you scale uh, it? Can you take it and transfer it? Can <laughs> you build on it? IP will worse number. Oh, good team. If we can hire the team. Brand. Potential of uh, scalability. He wasn't able to scale, it's going down. Okay. Customers, customers probably. Cont contract value durations. The, the revenue times the multiple. Brand looks like no Market potential, maybe. Hmm? Mark where, where the company is based. Where the company is nice. 
I mean, he's, he doesn't have any assets, any, any laptops, and it's like bring your own laptop to work. <laughs> he's a scrappy entrepreneur. Uh, maybe it's the. <laughs> If you have a product that's already selling in the market, would you care about the technologies? No, 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 no. I, I would. It's like you already have your product. You're doing fine. You fundraise. You now worth twenty five million dollars. Investors gave you four million dollars. You asked for three. They gave you four. Your revenues are picking up. You're about twenty five million dollars worth. How much you're going to pay buy map? Or why would you buy map? Just to get the two hundred k. If I buy, I would just merge. Yeah. But like, it, oh, yeah, you just, just, you buy it. Here you start. You pay with stocks. You're still buying it. You have valuable equity. He doesn't have valuable equity. So giving him some part of the equity. And most importantly, why? What are you going to pay? Less than what it will cost you to get 200k additional revenue. Nice. He has customers. He had customers. They under fifty thousand dollars worth. They're paying him money. They he lost him. Two hundred thousand dollars worth. Somebody still believes in it. How much would it? Cost to acquire the same customer. Probably more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Because if they if they're paying him something, probably cost is a little less. But again, I would spend six months convincing him, and maybe it's not the best. But like the technology may be there. Technology might not be there. What determines the valuation? MTV. MTV. Five time value of the customer. Are they sticking around? But unfortunately, there's one thing else. Location came as a point. If the startup is in the US, location. <coughs> what they would do for acquirers? How many people do you have? How many engineers do you have? Okay, I'll buy the engineering. I don't care what the product is. They build a product, fine. So they're able to build something. I'm going to come at you $200,000 per head. So 10 people, $2 million minimum, plus maybe 30% from the 10. 30% huh? from the 10 that was last year. Who cares? I'm just- I mean, it's just the number that investors think yeah, will be worth. So we went down 70%. Probably, the big problem he's facing is like, should I sell, should I not sell? Location is important and that's not to your Unfortunately, in the region, not many acquires happen. But if a company is trying to come into the same sector, is trying to come into the same domain from outside, trying to get market share in the region, maybe they'll go, okay, we'll find an alternative instead of building a team, instead of building engineers, instead of finding a, doing CR in Saudi, I'll buy a team out. And then maybe the company is worth five million. Because all the amount of work, all the amount of cost, all the amount of hires will go through this. Is just a waste of time. Instead of wasting my time, I'll give them five. It's fine. Who lost the time in this year? Investors. Investors. No, investors. investors might have probably lost, but yeah. what is the condition that they will not lose? Because uh, they will put it first, preferred shares, they will get their money first before it touch the fund. If they have liquidation preference. Yes. Again, this is something you need to practice really well. I mean, this is an exercise, and I wish it doesn't happen to you, but it happens to a lot of startups, and they don't know what to do when it happens. So my job is not to guide you through financial modeling and everything else, which we'll do, but just to guide you towards the end game. In you, so, it was first time I went to San Francisco, so Silicon Valley was nine, I think. So it's completely newbie, didn't know shit. I went and I hired, I, I found the cheapest place possible. So again, great bed bunks. How many of you have stayed in the bunks? Bunk beds? Hostel, you mean? Worse than hostel. Like oh, you, okay. you sleep with people, it's five. I think there was five on the guy's side and three on the female side because they had a smaller one. I don't know, like 10 guys living in 
a big room, like half of this room. Where in San Francisco? And this was in near Mountain View and Palo Alto. So walking distance to University Avenue. I didn't know anything about it. I just went there to get training to learn business model generation in startup. By the way, thanks. I'll come, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Sorry, guys. No, no, I'll tell you. Yeah, I'll pick up other people. So I went there, I said, I woke up, I was super tired, 16 hour flight, yada, yada, yada. So I, I wake up like nine, nobody's like awake. Everybody's like working, hustling. I went out, there's a huge kitchen table. Everybody's like hunkering down, except for one guy. So he keeps on going, he brings coffee. He asks people around, and he kind of, I realize that he's kind of talking to people, and he's taking them out, he's talking. And I didn't have anything to do, so I, I was on vacation, learning stuff. So I went out, I came back, and at night, I said, oh, we're going to have barbecue. And another came, another guy came, and again, he's talking to people, taking them out. Like, what's happening here? So then, I talked to other people and he, he came to me and I was like, what are you doing? And I said, I came here, I'm trying to learn entrepreneurship. I said, okay, thank you. I left. I like, no. <laughs> then I realized, I was like, fuck. I, I, he left, the barbecue guy left. Uh, it's very easy, like the, the kegs and everybody's happy. And then I asked like the, the house guy, it's like, what is this place? What's going on? They said, oh, I said, this is a hacker house. I was like, what? Hacker house. So, what are you hacking exactly? Why should I? Why? What am I doing here? So I, I thought I was going to read the thing. Um, so, so no, not that type of hackers. Okay, so you're ethical hackers, white hackers. No, no, not that kind. Of, I mean, yeah, there are the two kinds, like the black, and the white. I don't know anything in between. Yeah. No, I mean this is a hacker house. You branded it the way it is. I'm an ex-founder. I sold my company. It was Echo hired. You got what? Echo hired. Okay. I stayed with this company for two years. Now I left. I had some money. I bought this place. Now I'm getting developers from around the world. He was, I think, uh, Eastern European. I don't remember. Polish or I don't remember. Um, and now this is a hotbed for recruitment. World recruitment. So the guys that you keep, that came to talk to you is doing the barbecue. They're doing it for free. So, okay. Because they want to see what kind of talent we have. Okay, so these guys are coming from where? They're coming from everywhere. I'm getting them, I'm giving them the space for free. I'm getting 2% equity on their salaries. And you're getting like your white slave business. <laughs> I mean, how are you getting equity? You no, know, they're building companies. But Facebook, Google don't care about the companies they're building. They're building, they care about the talents these guys have. Two co-founders, half a million each, one million easy acquire. As long as they have traction in the market, if they put a product on the market. The guys are working, the first one who's, who's staying in the hacker house is from Facebook. The other one is from Google, who came and paid for the barbecue, whatever. And if they find the right like fit, they get 10% of their salary and I get 10% of what they do. So, the, okay, that's a good business. How come? Why? No, I mean, it's, it costs a lot of money for Google and Facebook to hire senior people who have experience in the field, who actually have done things. So instead of hiring senior people from other companies who are worth half a million dollars in salary, they're getting this technical talents who are entrepreneurial, who's building something. So they're not just coding day and night for no purpose. They're coding for a purpose. They know marketing, they know sales. They're getting a product out the door. So these guys are worth at least half a million dollars for Facebook and they'll give them $250,000 per year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, this is like 2,000 times or something. I was like, okay, so what does this, how does this work? I, I come from Turkey, there's no acquirers, nothing of that sort. Your value in the market and tech market is nothing because banks, telcos, large industry things, new graduates are easy to find. They can train these individuals to do whatever they want and they're valuable. And so they don't need to buy any one of them. 
However, you guys are startups. If you fundraise really well, in order to the cheapest way you're going to get people on board with the same passion, appetite for growth and doing things will be other startups. So hiring is really difficult in the beginning. Echo hiring could be a really good way to sell your company if you're not doing well. And this will happen. It's fine. That's okay. But you need to know if somebody is coming to you and telling you, okay, let's go, let's merge. I will give you my shares because you don't have anything. And then I need growth because investors gave me a lot of money. I don't want to spend six months onboarding a client. <laughs> We're doing a SaaS business. <laughs> it's very difficult to do a SaaS business. Right? And then you go, okay, what's the worth? How much time did you spend with these customers? Are they loyal to you? How much money should I be paying to acquire them into my startup? And if it works, maybe you'll grow together. So one of the things that's important, unfortunately, location is critical. In South, it might be valuable for people coming from outside. Team is absolutely valuable. IP, maybe yes, maybe no. Usually, you guys don't have the best products without technical debt. And I, those of you who understand what technical debt is, like your product doesn't work at the moment as well as it should. So we're trying to figure this out. On and on and on and on. You need new talent. They don't know what they're doing. So maybe IP could work if it's in the same language or if it's the same domain, but usually... This is like <coughs> non-existent. And multiples, good question, it doesn't exist. In the region, there are very few cases where somebody will come to you and say, oh, in the market, it's about three times, so I'll give you two times and then we'll negotiate. Nobody knows in SaaS market exponential, SaaS market uh, multiples in the region because nobody reports them that much. In US, you can extrapolate, you can kind of take examples. This company in the US was this, this company is the UK in this, but usually this also doesn't work at all. What works is the reason why you did the exercise. And these are all technical. You guys were very rational. You gave me a lot of examples. What is the number one thing that will, that will have you open the phone and even considering giving him an offer. What's the number one thing that- Like the person? Yeah, you as a star. He called you and he said, I mean, this is a situation. Let's work it out. What's There's... the number one thing? I like the person. I trust the person. Huh? Sales, no. You like I just like him. No. Do you like working with people you don't like? Life is too short to work with. People you don't like. <laughs> huh? Sometimes you have to. <laughs> Sometimes I you agree. have to sell to people you don't like. But I hope none of you will go through and will endeavor through working with people you don't like. That's rich. Huh? Investors. investors more. Do you marry people you don't like? Yes. He may be married the wrong people. I don't know. I not get that. But did but maybe you're not expecting to remain married for a very long time. Again. Let's go why investors do what they do. We talked a little bit about, they raise the money. How much time do they have after they raise money, VCs, to invest in them? Three years. Uh, seven years. The conversation is seven years. Normally five years. So the way I like to storyfy it is like giving birth. Right? First trimester, <laughs> second trimester, third trimester. Trimester is like three multiples in three. With babies, three months, three months, three months. I mean, that's called what a trimester is. For VCs, again, not exactly, but it works the same way. 
first three years, what do they do? Raise the fund. No, they raise the fund. They have it already. They have twenty million dollars. Deploy, deploy, deploy. Deploy. How many companies are they deploying? They have less than thirty million dollars. Five companies. Actually, they do it 50-50. How much do they put into the companies? 50%. 50 to 50%. When? In the first three years? 10%. Some says we're going to put 30, 30, 30. Uh, Maybe? No. 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 30. No. Maybe 10 percent, <laughs> 10 10 percent, and 50 percent, and 40 percent. No, 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 20 percent. And then another 100 percent in the first three years. Yeah. 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 I'm going to say 20, 30, 50. 20, 30, 50. Yeah. The last one is zero. Well, go, it's 40. Well, Maybe 10 percent in the beginning and like 70 ish percent. They have to keep 10 percent for themselves and nothing the last three years. Are we considering the follow ons here? Yes. Good question. What is a follow on? Yeah. Follow on investing in the same startup through a so how much money do they invest in the first round considering the follow-up? 20 percent. 10 percent. No, no. 10 to 20. In the first three months, it will be the minimum because they... Three months or three years? Three years. Three years. years. Let's try them. Sorry, so I need it with the babies. Okay. Are we considering several fundraising for the same VC? No, it's a one fund. It doesn't matter if they have second, third. The one fund, they raise 30 minutes. So... What happens at the end of uh, the journey? That's the investment. You don't do it. Matchmaking. What's the purpose of the VC? How do they make money? <laughs> <laughs> Where do they get their when? Acquisition. The last, the last. Yeah. Usually, this is not three years. This is the fund is usually ten years ish. Yeah. But to make it easier, we'll make it nine. <coughs> so this is the place yeah. where there is no money going into the startups. They want the money to come oh, into the fund. So. This is where they put nothing. Okay? Zero. Because they put the money in the first part. How do they divide between two? 60, 40, or 70, 30. 20 millions now, and they wait for 10? 50, 50. 20, 80. 20, 80. I mean, very simple. No. They put X, and they have to reserve 2X. Because that's what the follow on is for. Yeah. So I put money into many startups, let's say 10 startups, yeah. and I hope, inshallah, it doesn't work that way, five of them will still be alive and will be worth putting more money in. Let's say, and the reason why it's double the amount of money, because they were worth 10 million when they invested, so each of them, they put one million. Don't worry about math. Yes. Now they're worth more. So their valuation is higher. In order to not to dilute my share, I need to put more money. And the only money I put is the money I reserve. So I can put at least twice the amount of money I originally put. If they're really, it's 10 times, 50 times, and I, 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 I try to do whatever I can. So this is the only period in the fund life cycle that they will invest in. They're not investing you usually after year three. So you guys who didn't know this mathematics before, when you go out and try to understand who's going to give you money, the first thing you need to ask is what's the vintage year? It's like wine, haram, but <laughs> it's worked like that. Like, what's the school year of kids? If they fundraise four years ago, the VC, okay. then you have no chance, almost no chance, 99.9% of the time, you're not going to get money from that VC. So, why is the VC talking to you? They don't have any money left for new investments. <laughs> But Why are they even bothering to talk with Because you don't relationship with the next They are probably fundraising themselves or they're planning to fundraise 
after year five, yeah. somewhere here, right? They can show they were able to get to the team. So they're lining you up. But they're saying, oh, we are able to find great teams like this, and we'll go to the LPs and we'll ask for more money. But you're not going to get any money from them within the next six months because they, they haven't done anything. Will they tell you that? No, they do not say that. Yes. They when? When will they tell you that? Uh, the product is not uh, good enough. For the when? When? When, will tell, when will they tell you? Do you when do you ask? So like at the end of but like even before you you ask them before you meet you do your own you talk to them and say he's almost getting the fund if he's almost getting the fund then he's convinced that he's gonna give you a piece maybe but you have the time to survive until he fundraises six years six months eight months sometimes they do if you're fundraising very little they can invest that. and then, but then it's a tricky issue. So the lock that I was trying to tell you. So this is very different than what you originally think. Like VCs have money, they will invest in you. I mean, some, they have the money, not in their back, by the way, but their job is to find new startups if they want to be in the business of investing again. If not, maybe they're never going to raise money. Is the answer? So the answer is that will be probably somewhere around 10 million here, less, they'll reserve another 20, plus they're going to take 2% usually out of the $30 million as salaries themselves. So 2%, yeah, around 2% per year in 10 years, so they get... 20% of the whole thing, but again, not that well much. There's different mechanics, don't worry about it. So when they have a fund for 30 million, they cannot put 30 million because they need to pay salaries, they need to pay other things. And they don't, they're not rich. It's not their money. So for our due diligence, what are we supposed to ask them? What's you need first magnet or any other resource, uh, step has resources. Search when they first announced their fund. If it's five years ago, oh, they have no money left. Or they have done deals, their ratings. Sometimes they do when there's an echo hire. So in the process, between year three and year four, if there's a startup that's okay, but not so okay, they can have an acquisition. So early acquisition, four years down the road, they say, you invested us when you were 5 million, somebody wants to kind of buy us out for 3 million, and they kind of couldn't call the company, they couldn't fundraise, can we do this? And I mean, I think investors, you don't have it before, usually. So you say, okay, fine, if you want to quit, if you want to sell, fine, go sell. So you get, so they get their money back sometimes in the second trimester, and then that's maybe when they kind of, that's called recycling. They recycle the money into startups, new startups. So when you have to search about this very thoroughly, and you're lucky in a way because they're not like 1,000 VCs. When, when do they start the second cycle? Is it like in C? Second cycle or? of investment? Yes. To so existing founders or new founders? No, new funds. When they have like when they finish. Like they finish. <laughs> so after year five, they start fundraising themselves. Okay. Or their second fund. Another. And in the middle, they announce they have a first close of their second fund. And then they can start investing into new, new startups. <laughs> but they usually don't do it before it's year five or four. So there's like two in parallel, like after yeah, they have multiple funds. Usually they have multiple funds in parallel. So it becomes like a ladder. This thing works. So they raise money, 10 year fund, year five. This is fund one, year five. They raise a larger fund. This becomes fund two. And probably they raise fund three. Uh, this shows like this is like a ladder. And every year they try to scout, but their job becomes they try to sell these startups. 
to, to close the fund. In the meantime, they're investing into new startups. Sometimes they have already investors and they do a small close. They start investing a little bit, but usually they, they make a big announcement. Because that's a big thing. So then every time there's a fund, they have to conclude yeah. at the end of the fund. Usually, this is VCs. Family funds work differently. Yeah. So if, if it's a corporate VC, they have evergreen funds. So they can keep on investing. But again, you need to search. You need to look for them uh, technically. So they have like 10 startups, uh, one fund investing in 10 startups. By the end of the five year uh, um, maturity of the fund, they have to report on it. And it's always has to so be there. They probably have called all the capital. <laughs> and they'll just start trying to exit. And how, how do they write off the bad startups or the startup at the top? Yeah, halas. Money gone. Okay. <laughs> no big deal. How long does it take to raise a fund? Oh, good question. For VCs, how long does it take to raise a fund? Yes. Uh, first fund, not less than a year. Yeah. Absolutely very rare. Uh, but even if it's not, it's the second fund, it's easier. Yeah, yeah. But if it's taking three years to raise a fund, then they're not raising the fund. Yeah, it depends. There are good cases. They'll do a first cases. close and a second close. Yeah, yeah. they do. Close. They say we raised a little, and then they say we're still raising a little. A little before, they say oh, we did a second close. And then and at the end, they're like, okay, we are announcing our $20 million fund, from which they already invested some, because somebody yeah. said, well, we're okay with the first close. But on a 20 million fund, you can't do a first close when you have only $2 million. And any, you need to have at least a little bit of money, one third, one, like half, then you go a little bit more deeper. So for, for, for it, when, when an early acquisition happens, don't they have to give back the money to the LPs? No, no, no money until the fund is closed. No, no, they recycle the money. They recycle the money. So they say, okay, this is the money. It will get into the accounts again. It depends on the mandate of the fund and the regularities, but usually they don't give back the fund until the fund is closed. On very rare occasions, they can't put the money back in. But usually they do because it's not that much of money. So it's mostly a timing matter for them. Huh? A timing matter for yeah, them. Yeah, I mean, the fund has a, has a limited lifetime entity. It wow. will close 10, maximum 12 years, but it will close. Okay, that's the way. Then only and then uh, calculate the whole thing. This is how much you gave me. This is how much I made you. I'll keep 20%, you'll get 80%. So they don't do distribution until the fund is closed, usually. <laughs> so, uh, aren't there uh, VCs funds that they think by the fifth year they can invest in new startups instead of you know doing the follow on them to increase the probability of you know having. They usually don't, they reserve it for the next fundraise because they usually fundraise at a much- And why, 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 why do you not take that approach? Because that's not how it's built. But technically uh, they raise money to return it at a certain time. Yeah. And they can't say, okay, by the by year five, <coughs> they have to close the company in, in 10 years max and 12. So that's the trick. But the most important piece we'll do in the other session is to, again, I'm not against fundraising. Don't get me wrong. If you got the matrix, investors will find you. That's perfectly fine. You don't, you just don't feel pressured that you need to fundraise to be successful. It's fine if your model depends on your growth, if your model depends on your success, but you guys have to understand one thing. This is the closing. And I, I really think, yes, finance will, will do more numbers. But the first question I ask to come, people who used to come to me and ask for money. I mean, I invested in, I think, 12 startups. Like, first question, like, why do you want to sell your company? And they go like, usually, I mean, the ones that come to me are usually for this, for that, for that, fine. But do you have an answer to that question? The minute you get VCs inside, you need to sell your company. Most probably to another company, very rarely to the public, which is IPO. If you want to plan and if you think what you're doing is your life's work, 
Then you say, okay, I'll do an IPO. I don't want a trade sale. So I will keep on doing what I am doing because this is what my life is for. If that's the case, fine. You can still fundraise. If you say, I don't want, to, I'm not going to sell my company, they will like, wait, what? <laughs> Why are you raising money? You don't need to raise money to be successful. You can build a growing, high scalable growing company, even with revenue, yeah. even if you don't have funding from external investors. But sometimes you just need to grow in a competitive environment to outgrow your competitors, to do something that nobody has done, to do more R&D, to do this, to do this, to capture a market, to buy out other startups. You need money. That's OK. But again, it's not just a small portion of your company you're selling, you are promising to me as a VCGP that you are okay to sell your company in seven to 10 years, <clears throat> maybe sooner. I don't know, but you will get me my money back. That's why you allowed me. The word allow is important. You're allowing me to get 20% of your company. You're not selling 20% of your company. You're doing the same technically, number-wise, but that's the mindset you should be in. I am getting your money in return of equity, and I agree we will grow together, yeah. but then I will sell my company. Because you will force me to sell my company. And I will fundraise. Again, another thing you, you have to just Realize which is like fundamentals in 24 months and in technically 18 months. You raise now in 18 months, you will fundraise again. <laughs> again, the trimester model works as well. Let's do it in a different perspective. First three months, sorry, first six months. Six, six, six. You just figuring, sorry for the French, shit out. You promised me this is what will happen if you spend money on marketing. This is what your CAC will be. This is how many people you will have. This is how much revenue you'll generate. La 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 la. You promised me, you promised me, and I'm an idiot. I kind of am fine. But I believe in you. I'm giving you the money to test what you think will work out. What usually happens in the first six months? Something's good, something's bad. You realize you're in, deeper, in a good position, much better than you thought. Even in your wildest dreams, you didn't think you have that many customers in six months. You guess what? Sometimes it happens. That's called product market fit. It, it works. You just customers drive them, the product out of the <coughs> Inshallah, it will work for everyone. Usually it doesn't, but hopefully it does. So you're trying to figure this out. And in the next six months, you actually know what you're doing. If you did a lot of tests, <coughs> some worked, some didn't. You learned, you hired somebody, it didn't work out, you fired that person, you hired another person. Now it starts to kind of build momentum. This is where the momentum happens, inshallah. So learning <coughs> or the fan, and then you've learned something. Now it's working out, and you have six months worth of money left in the bank, except for revenue. So if revenues keep on coming, it's fine. But remember, you haven't built a company that you don't have maybe business economics positive model yet. You're kind of assuming it will get there, but you have six months money left. That's why I kept asking him, like, how much money you have left, how much money you have left, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So, fine, there's six months. You have to go and fundraise again. That's the expectation. That's the lifestyle. And in the last six months, what are you not doing? Working in the company. Because you're always outside trying to hunt the investors, trying to answer their questions, trying to build a due diligence folder, trying to build a data room trying to go to events, trying to talk to other investors. That's your life for the last six months. Yeah. Is it enough six months to fundraise? 
In yes. Usually no. Right now it's between eight to twelve months, even so. Yeah. So, so we have to get traction in the first six months. The reason I keep pushing, I know this is there's going to be an exercise. <laughs> You'll do it by yourself. Is exactly for that reason. What used to last three to six months is now lasting a lot longer. Yep. If it ever happens, as well as like, what if you don't fundraise? I my job is to make you build companies you like to work in. I am not an investor in any of you, and Takadam is not an investor as well. Even in investment oriented programs, I do a lot of those. I tell the same thing. If you survive long enough. You will get acquired because you're creating value. And if in this environment, if you're creating revenue, if you have customers, if you have been able to get to them at an economic model where unit economics are positive, you're frugal enough that you're able to survive. Even if you don't fundraise, somebody else will come and buy you out when this storm is over. Yeah. So you'll build value, that's fine. And if you don't, that's also okay. You can crash and burn before raising funds super painful but learning experience we'll do better <laughs> next time inshallah Nani. it will happen i mean you should say oh <laughs> like 90 percent of the startups fail but i'm not at that 90 percent <laughs> it's like okay so in this room this is only the 10 percent and outside there's 90 90 others no, that's not you it's not it's like saying Oh, it's not you, it's us, it's me, it's me. It doesn't work that way. So again, that's the cycle, yeah. Pulling back to uh, the question of why would you sell your company? Yes. Why not? <coughs> I don't know, I'm not. I mean, I mean, were you talking about this as a, a mistake or no. something wrong? No, I mean, I told you I'm building two companies. One is Sage. I'm not going to sell that company. Never. That's what I love doing day to day. And if I get paid for it, halas, yeah. it's break even. It's yeah. I mean, I mean, like the first question you ask yeah. us here: Who is the material entrepreneur? Yeah. So who sold his company to to consider him as a super successful uh, man in the room? No, right. not selling a company is not super successful. Yeah. What? Who is the? Least successful founder of the last 10 years. Least successful. Yeah. Okay. Elon Musk. Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll specify. Somebody sold their company. It's going to be much easier. Somebody sold their company for a million dollars. It's the biggest failure of our last generation. What's the one? Instagram. 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 Worst, worst founder as in terms of results. Maybe I don't really want it. He just raised a billion dollars. Yeah, he's, he's, a, yeah, yeah. he's in a different position. Yeah. Nobody believed this guy is a failure when he sold this company to a billion dollars. Wow. He's not. He is. So if Facebook didn't have Instagram, Facebook would be dead by now. Yes. How how much is Facebook's worth? Some multi million, multi billion dollars, billion. Without Instagram, they would have been dead by now. But would by Instagram far. be Instagram if it wasn't for Facebook? It's Snapchat, Snapchat because of Facebook, or they didn't sell it. Again, this is a longer conversation. Why are you selling your company? Is the question I ask to understand what's your success criteria that you put into yourself. Yeah, like the founder of Snapchat who didn't sell. To, yeah, he refused to sell. Will he be happy at the end? Is he successful? The only person who's going to tell you that you are successful or not is who? You. You. Sorry. Or your customer. You're happy or no? I mean, you, you'll be happy, but you'll be still. know you're successful if you get to where you want. If selling your company is where you want to go, and if you sell your company, $10 million, not work for the rest of your life. If that's what you are planning to do with this startup, that's perfectly fine. I have nothing to say. Or if you're telling me, no, you know what? I'm not doing this. I will sell this company so I can start something bigger. I need some money to do something else much larger. <coughs> this is the one. 
And that's new stories that. That's a little must story. Like it or not, he did pay for to be able to raise enough money to be able to have enough money to do science and research and rockets and cars. And, and he, he needed the money, he didn't have it. Nobody gave it to him. So he built a company, he sold it. He had money, he just put everything he owns into two companies. Sold That's it. his happiness. That's what he's happy with. He would, is he going to be happy? Would he have been happier if he hadn't sell the X.com or is he going to be happy who's going to buy Tesla? Maybe he's going to sell it, maybe. But again, that's his life. That's actually why I tell the founders, like, why are you the person selling the company? And the problem is, you're two co-founders. You might have different reasons to sell the company or even to start the company. Ah, uh, yes, good, perfect. Let's have that conversation now. Because if you want wealth, and the other guy says, what are you talking about? I'm okay working with this. I'm not gonna sell. They're going, what, with? huh? I thought we would sell and be rich. Ah, no, I want to do this. That's what I studied. That's what I want. That's what I thought. I want to be in this company for a long time. Okay, that's fine. No, the co-founders limit. And no, beforehand, you start the financial conversation. Assumptions, revenue models, cost, cash flow. Blah, blah, blah. That's what you need to know. And that's not usually taught in programs other than Takadam. <laughs> I do this a lot, but my priority is to make sure you guys are aligned yeah. personally, as well as as a team, and you know what you're doing in terms of numbers. Numbers are easy. In Excel, we have a saying, and sorry, I know it's not the most polite way to do this, but I don't have the best version. S gets in, S gets out in financial modeling. Like if you put junk, junk gets out. In all of your financial models, I can make you more profitable in less time. Just give me half an hour. <laughs> I will make sure you're not going to understand what happened, but you will be profitable in less time than you thought, or I will make sure you'll never get to profitability. And you will not have any idea how that happened. And you're like, oh, magic. This is how it works in financial modeling, except when it's real. The moment it gets real is when you understand what are the sources of finance, you as a person are going to put that will make you from jump that to that. And you need resources and we'll work on this. So financing is a long-term game. And yes, some of these elements are not available in the Middle East, fine. There are some startups trying to make this available in the Middle East, okay? Like loans, share capital, mortgages, bank loans, those are long term. Medium terms, again, some banks do loans, inshallah. Uh, leasing, yeah, maybe. Um, never heard of the venture in, in Middle East. Higher purchase, sort of leasing, but not really. But again, don't worry, these are two financial terms. Short terms is inventory level management. Uh, reduce debtors, increase credits, like accounts payable, accounts receivable, AR, AP in the form, uh, overdrafting, uh, again, yeah, works. Trading surplus, grants and gifts, inshallah, takadam. Revenue, sale of goods, sale of services. Sometimes, sometimes, intangible. Some of you are software as a service. Yeah, we have a bit. Just, uh, <laughs> can you give me so, uh, can, you, can you go back just to make sure, please? Oh, yes, please. So, <laughs> now, yeah. you know, people say there is that bunch of by SBCC. Yeah, they say, and then you ask them how many, and they're like, inshallah, So, I learned in, in, in Middle East, there are two inshallahs. <laughs> What is exactly the, your relationship with God? It's like, inshallah, he will now and will get it. And the other one's like, I don't know, I didn't hear from him for a while. So, inshallah. What is it? I'm saying the good inshallah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm here to help you identify the sources that suits your plan and potentially, realistically, keeps you alive. All right. I finished all my three cycles of pep. Please, I'm jumping high enough. So this is some this is a book I actually saw 
A copy, don't get that copy from you. Go by yourself. Uh, this is very important. Again, something you, you guys are missing for a while is, is or not missing, but haven't thought of is control versus wealth. So in the normal world of business, if you have 50% of a company with your co-founder, each one has one vote to decide what happens. So in SMEs, percentages are usually reflected exactly into decision making. If somebody has 80% of the company and somebody has 20% of the company, usually this guy is the decision maker, right? That's what you're accustomed to. That's how business works outside of the startup. However, in the startup side, somebody can have 80% of the company, another person might have 20% of the company, but decision-making could be 50-50. When would this happen? Now here, in the term sheet, different shareholders agreement. Different classes of shareholders agreement. If the investor who put 20% put in a line that says, I'm going to have one board seat and I'm letting you only to have, you could be four co-founders, who cares? You'll have one board seat and I'll have one board seat. And if you agree, oh, that's what happens. So then who gets to break the time if you don't make up your mind on something? Third one. Usually there has to be a third one, but in some cases, decisions has to be unanimous. So if you don't convince your investor, you can't make a decision. Very simple. Is this happening? In the region? <coughs> Unfortunately, it does happen in the region. But usually they revert back to the local regulations. But yeah, this has nothing to do, right? This is local. Yeah, there's regulatory, there's term sheets. Everything is legal, legit. So who will be most rewarded at the sale of the company in this case? Whoever has 80% of the company. Yeah. <coughs> who gets the most money out of a sale? The majority. Whoever has the percentages. These are real shares in. <laughs> <laughs> but even with preferred shares, if you have 80%, you're going to get 80% reward. Depends on preferred shares or not. So, but who's going to make the decisions? You have to make the decisions yourself together with the investor, whoever that is. So somebody, there are even different cases. So you raised money with 5%, and then somebody else gave you 15%, and this person has board seat. This person has board seat, and you guys have one board seat. Angel investor, you gave a board seat to the angel investor. And then the VC came, you gave a board seat to the VC. And now you have one board seat. Angel has one, VC has one. If you sell, you'll get 80% rewarded. Fine, wealth, your money. But they can decide to kick you out of the company. What happens if they kick you out of the company? <coughs> you still have your world, but you don't have the control. Minus the side. The control. You still have 80% of the company. If it's a legally tight agreement, they can't get that 80% out of you. But what will happen? They keep on fundraising, they keep on fundraising, whoever they replace you with, then you'll get diluted, but still you will own your shares unless something quirky happens. In it. But what do you have in the company? You don't have any control. You don't have any say. Maybe you're still a board member, but you're no longer the CEO. Maybe you have one vote among three, but you're no longer the CEO. You're no longer the CTO. You're no longer anybody. So you sit in the board. <laughs> people come and tell you what they're doing with your company. They fire you as a CEO. Are you okay with that? Yeah. If not, don't do this. Because this happens in year four or five, almost all VC funded startups. 
you will be fired. And, or you will tell, I am perfectly capable of increasing this company's revenue from zero to 10 million. <coughs> I am perfectly from zero to 200 people. But I am not capable to run a 1,000 people company. I am not capable to create a company that is going to have $100 million of sales. You may not be that person, which is perfectly okay. Those are two different skill sets. Creating something versus skipping something, those are very different animals. And it's not a multiplication issue. I don't think it's it's, uh, it's easy for founders to, uh, like, you know, understand they are good at creating, but they are not good at scaling. Exactly. Before, usually, because this is not a conversation they have. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Which is me in this case. Like or, or like a mentor or like a consultant or like someone who... Yeah, yeah, yeah true. But again, like, thinking about it is critical. First, you need to have this conversation within yourself. And then you need to have this conversation with your co-founders. Then you say, okay, this is a plan. We are getting to a level where we might need to fundraise. Here's what should happen because, I mean, 18 months, plus 18 months, plus 18 months. Your job is to grow the company five times, 10 times in one year. Five times, 10 times in one year. Five times, 10 times, even more in three years. So you'll be managing 10 to 20 to 100 times more of a company in three years. That's what scaling is about. That's what Karim did. They grew 10 times a year. They literally grow 1,000% in three years. 10 times 10, 10, sorry, 10 times 10, and then the last year was nine. So they literally grew almost a thousand times. Captain number, revenue number, cycling, everything. Yeah, I mean, it's not easy, right? And then Dr. Elias was in Real last week in a small conversation. So then I burned out and I got lost. I, I had to disappear for two months. Literally. Yeah. Again, are you okay with this? If not, then what are you okay with? Okay, what, what are the signs? can notice you know, the co-founders or like the company founding team that says, okay, they are not fit for scaling the company from that state. What kind of things that you should notice? Well, it's, it's usually very easy and it starts with communication. If you're not, if you're meeting milestones fast, really, really, really fast and you're hesitant, then it's very tricky. If you don't have a chief of staff in year two, uh, maybe you're not ready to scale. If you think you're going to be hiring everybody and you'll see everyone after number 100, maybe you're a little bit of a control freak. So your hires will tell me, and in every fundraising round, you will need to tell me who you're going to hire. I have a question here, David? Yeah. Okay. It's very quick the one about the, the shares. You mentioned that some founders might have 80% and then the other investors, they have the 20%. I've actually read about the practice of putting founders on vesting. True, true, true. Uh, I'll come to that. Okay. Yeah. And that will be one of the last things. But let me finish the question. In your deck, this is what I do with founders I help. Oh, I'm fundraising. And the first question I ask, why are you doing this? And I ask, who are you going to hire? Oh, I'm going to hire a salesperson. Okay. Who? No, a salesperson. Like, who? Oh, I'll find a salesperson. Like, who? Who are you going to hire? Exactly. Oh, I'll think about it later. Then you don't know who you're going to hire. And you don't know how much time it will take to hire that person. You don't know what they want. You don't know their market rates. You don't know what you can do to convince them to join you. You have no idea what you're talking about. Go do your homework. Come back. What do I do? Find me five people that you're going to hire or short this, when you got my money. Oh, it will take time. Done. Good job. Go do your homework. You need to know exactly. 
LinkedIn profile, CV. I am going to hire this person and this person or this person or this person or this person because I need this, I need this, I need that. I need their experience. I need their contacts. I need their name. I need whatever. <clears throat> These are the five people. And I know almost exactly how much I will pay them. Oh, their market. I know how much their retail ones. How much are, is Unilever paying them? You don't know? Go do your homework. What so, sick ones? How much is a chief operating officer or a manager in an RMX division that's managing 200 packages every minute is paid for? Or uh, healthcare, how much are they paid for in the market? Or fintech, how much is a VP of finance getting paid in Arab Bank or Talco real estate? Like you need to know exactly who you're going to hire to convince me that you know what you're going to do with my money or with anybody. But that's a critical. I mean, I mean, early stage. If we are talking about pre pre seed, uh, I heard like a hiring plan, but naming for short lesson because these names that you said are mainly like a headhunting, and as a pre seed, yes. you have that money to headhunt. Yes. So we go with underdogs or uh, no. the fresh. The fresh first money. hundred people you cannot outsource to a headhunter. Yeah. No, you I mean, I mean, no, no, I mean I, I would, yeah. yes. I would, that's your job. Yes. Again, what was the question? You don't want to burn it again. He's telling you, I'm waiting for the cash to do the exercise. So the question was, how do I know if you're ready to scale or not? Uh -huh. I will know you're ready to scale when you give me a list of people that you're trying to convince to work with you to scale the company. I mean, in the early, in yes. the early days, hiring plan is not... Uh, so. I don't care about the hiring plan. You find people. Here's what they're finding. Hiring patterns, we find. Everybody's around. But I know it's, you may not get there. But again, you tell me, my cousin is working in for the last 10 years. He hates his job, but I need to pay him, otherwise, my aunt will kill me. But I'm hiring him not because he's my cousin, because he has this, he has this, he has this, he has this, he has this. Okay. If he joins, I will also pay him some equity. So, yeah. he's all, I'm not going to pay him market rate, but he's okay. He's the right person. And I don't need to pay a headhunter to find a particular person. And I'm okay with working with him because we grew up together. We suffered together. He's the right person to be on my side when I'm kind of soldiering through. Again, scaling issue and everything else. Okay. Uh, we're going to have a five-minute break. So, I want to give you a, a homework and leave you for half an hour. So I'll do a better job. There are, so one part of the things that you need to be doing, and I, I know this hurts, but I wish somebody told me this before. So there are some financial resources where the decision-making is yours completely, 100%. The money in your bank account, uh, your car, not the family car, um, things that you have accumulated over the years, things that you can sell, or Jedi lightsaber, I have one, uh, and I actually was trained as a lightsaber artist in San Francisco, those are crazy things, I'll show pictures, and there are things you have control, but not 100%, so borrowing from your family, you have some control, but not 100%. They will probably give you some money, but you don't have control. So from top to bottom, 100% control to 0% control. That's completely external. Short term, in days, weeks, you need to have a piece of paper that says, I can get this much amount of money by this much certainty in a week. Maybe not your car, because it will take some time to sell your car. That's the midterm in a month. I have control over the sale of my car, 100%, so I'll put it here. Maybe there are some things that you don't have full control, but you have maybe, and one of them is borrowing from banks. As a person, this is not a company. This is you as a co-founder. You have... Some percentage of control in borrowing from friends, not 100%, not as much as your family, but not as little as 
some level of certainty. <coughs> and there's long term things like months, maybe two, three, four months. House, it's yours, personal loans, some shares. You have 100% control, some percent of control, or you have maybe 10% control because you build a relationship with your uh, bank. So this is what you need to work on and that this half an hour. This is a solo exercise. I have to tell you again, you do it by yourself. And this is not your company. This is you as the co-founder. So short-term, mid-term, and long-term, 100% control, 0%. And if it's zero, don't put it here. Say ten percent. Pick at least three items per column. If you have more, it's fine. You can make it more complex. You can do it on a laptop. It's easier to make calculations. So things you have hundred percent control. Again, this is. A personal exercise. One second. The reason I want you to do this exercise in the next half an hour, don't talk to your bank account and I don't want statements. I am not going to see what you're working on. It is very, very personal. So 2008, no, 2009, when my daughter was born, I know. I had two co-founders who were working to create a co-working space in Istanbul. Two of them were not Turkish residents. One of them was Dutch, married to a Turkish uh, lady. The other was uh, an American citizen, not married. I think he was a spy, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> so, that's story. so we were working to create a co-working space, okay? I had very slow. So, Business models, financial modeling, outreach, customer segmentation, licensing, cost of furniture, cost of rent, everything is done. Like we know what we had a plan for. So I'm the financial guy. We needed, I think back then it was in, in dollar terms, the dollar was like so not compared to what's happening now. Well, let's say thirty thousand dollars. I'm working as a full-time employee. I, I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't have $30,000. I know that other people don't have $30,000, but one of them was American and his family was wealthy. The other was married to a Turkish lady and her family was okay. And he was already, he had, he had a small exit. So that was what I knew about them. And that's what they knew about me. Newly, new, not newly married, but like, I have a, I, my daughter, three months old. This is like February 2010. So that is less than six months. We did this, all this. We found a place. And we had to sign the rent agreement for one year. This is on Tuesday. So we decided. And then we said, who's going to sign the rent agreement? And everybody's like, what do you mean? Like, you, <laughs> exactly. So they went like you're Turkish. Yeah, so sorry. we're not even from here. Yeah. We don't even know if our signature counts. Yeah, it does. It's the first you live, you have residence in Turkey, it counts, but like what, what do you the rent contract that has a two-year undisputed, I can't leave it, I have to pay it like this. So it will be only on my name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, I only own 20% of the company. Yeah, because we're working full time for the company. You only work half time. You have a salary. That's why you own 20%. So we had that conversation. Who owns what percentage? And what the decision making, we also had that conversation. Decision making will be unanimous. So everybody has to agree. Even if I had 20%, I had equal say in what the company is going to do. So wealth wise, talked about. Control wise, talked about. Who's going to freaking sign the rent agreement? Personal liability. Yeah. I was like, I thought you were going to do it. I thought we were going to do it. No, I thought uh, you were going to. Oh, no, I thought that's Tuesday. Yeah. And we have to go and sign the whole thing. So, okay. 
So, and who has the money to put the deposit? I don't have it. I don't have it. So I thought you were going to keep No, I don't have it. So who's going to put the, oh, we, we were going to apply for a bank loan. Okay. Who's going to sign the bank loan? Yeah. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, 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 seriously, because they don't have any credibility in the bank. Because you don't want the utility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, 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 uh, uh, it made sense to me. It did, also, it made sense to them, yeah, Danny, because and I said, okay, let's put a collateral. Who's going to sign the collateral? Maybe my wife can sign the collateral. Okay. Who was the CEO uh, of the company? Not me. Yeah, one of them. <laughs> the one who's supposed to sign. Again, yeah, I know, but like, no, no, no. I mean, we have equal share, equal rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. exactly. <laughs> Thing is my yeah, yeah but like the rent agreement is only uh, the Turkish guy. <laughs> That's Tuesday. Man, we worked like nine months to a year to get this whole thing done. We had a licensing agreement with another co-working space in Belgium or in France. Like it's it's a big one. I'll just I'll continue yeah, the discussion with you in private because I have the same issue. Yeah, yeah. and then on the same co-working space. Tuesday, this happened. But I have to exactly repeat what I want to discuss. We, we went to a baklava. Because the place we were working was right in front of a baklava store, the best one in Turkey. I mean, we said, let's eat sweet and talk sweet, you know? <laughs> we had a lot of baklava that did really well. In Istanbul. Yeah, where? Which part? In Karakur. There is a really good place that you guys usually go to get your baklava. And on the same street, they have the factory. Not, not the MX uh, No, no, no. Not, they're just, this, yeah, MX activity existed. So it's a really beautiful place. Tuesday. We had this conversation. We had the buckle. I said, we sit on it, we talk about it, we go to our families and ask for family, maybe, and then and on my kids, he has to ask for parents. But my, the, the American guy is like, uh, I don't think I can bring the money back to Turkey. He had the money, yeah? not that he didn't have the money. Yeah, it's like, what's it called? The family foundation. He's, 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 he's wealthy, but not able to get, apparently, I knew he was healthy, but healthy, but he didn't have the right to use the funds for something else. Fine. Thursday, we talked to the rent lists and said, can you reduce the cost? Can we not sign a collateral that will make me liable for two years? Can we jump back? Yeah, that it didn't work out. Last time I spoke with them was the Monday. Literally. On Monday, we said, you don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. What's the point? We've been working for this. And they blamed me because I still got paid. Uh, I, had a, yeah. I had a job. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they said, oh, we thought you you said you're not going to quit your job. Yeah, I just have a baby. She's not even six months old. I can't quit the job because our revenue projects, which I did, doesn't show break even for two years. Again, F gets in, F gets out. So what are you going to do, Yanni? You were not going, they were not going to sell it for a while. That was okay. And then last time, literally in, in five, six days, we said, Hello. And I didn't even speak to them. One of them, I didn't, I still haven't spoken to him for years. He left. The American one. Uh, but the other one was living in Turkey. I saw him in other things. But then literally, I responded here. Why? Because nobody told me to do this freaking thing. Nobody told me how much money I would risk and put into anything, let alone a court case, the large rent agreement. Uh, and then once you do this in half an hour, we still have time. Tomorrow, inshallah, I think we can finish it. We're going to come back. Alice, we can continue tomorrow, right? Yeah. Release them early, they'll be great.